Hi, my name is Carol Imberton. I'm a professor of history at the University at Buffalo. Thank you for being here. Uh, we're talking about your book today, Beyond Redemption, Race, Violence in the American South After the Civil War. And the first question I always begin with is, um, what brought you to this topic? And, um, you know, how? what did you discover in researching it? Yeah. Well, I was beginning my dissertation research in the fall of 2001, the summer and fall of 2001. Um, and so, of course, right in the middle of that preparation um, was 9-11. And for us, for most people who were, you know, alive and, and, you know, adults at the time, you know, it was a, you know, a, you know, at this really profound moment, especially for someone like me who was interested in political violence, its efficacy, its sort of longstanding uh, impact on American history. Um, and in particular, I began to think about what it must have been like uh, for people, but particularly for formerly enslaved people, um, to kind of live in this, uh, you know, all encompassing sort of atmosphere of, you know, threats, intimidation, and outright violence after the Civil War. How did how did they manage? And of course, they did. We know from um, you know wonderful books like Stephen Hahn's *A Nation Under Our Feet* that they uh, free people did manage to impact um, the political structures in the South and form, you know, really powerful and vibrant grassroots political organizations. Um, but yet when I started digging into the sources, particularly um, governor's papers, Southern governor's papers, um, and I was reading letters that freed people were writing or were having um, people write to the governor on their behalf, I was really struck by how many of those letters were asking for protection asking for troops, asking for some kind of law enforcement, and in many cases, asking for weapons, for guns. They were, you know, they were saying, well, if you can't send troops, if you don't have people to, to protect us, give us guns, we'll do it ourselves. Um, and these long, you know, these lengthy descriptions describing um, what they had been through, the kinds of the levels of harassment and intimidation and outright violence they were experiencing, and how this was affecting their everyday lives, their ability to work, their ability to, you know, go about their day, to raise their children, to go to church, to go to school, um, the kind of things that we, of course, take for granted. Um, for them, you know, all of the calculations that they made um, every day about what to do and where to go were in many ways uh, structured, right, by this widespread violence in the South, Um after the Civil War. Yeah, and one of the things that I uh, really appreciated about the book is that you kind of set up these uh, dualities or dichotomies between kind of the white experience and the black experience. And uh, the first one you kind of established, the big one of the book, is kind of this tension between Southern redemption, which I think needs to be explained a little bit, and reconstruction, which I think we we kind of know the basic outline of that. But if you could kind of walk us through how redemption contrasted re reconstruction and how those two kind of yeah. played off each other. Yeah. Well, the one thing that the book tries to set out to do is to show what a an important concept ideologically and culturally redemption was to people during the mid 19th century. And of course, for abolitionists, they were very much concerned with redeeming the slave, right? And what that would mean. And so you see the radical Republicans in Congress uh, really thinking about trying to um, in some ways, right the wrongs of the past, right? Um, to give in formerly enslaved people the tools and the rights that they needed in order to live fulfilling free lives. But of course, for white Southerners, redemption had a, you know, a completely different meaning, although they're both coming from sort of this Judeo-Christian uh, culture. Um, for white Southerners, it 
you know, they begin to think about how to redeem the South from the loss of the Civil War uh, and uh, Black Republican rule, as they called it. Um, And they wanted to, you know, they saw themselves as the victims of uh, great injustices um, and the, the overreach of the federal government. And they wanted to try to create a movement based upon this idea of redemption and redeeming the South from those injustices. So actually the movement to sort of reestablish Southern, what they called home rule, democratic rule in the South, um, and to um, pacify that grassroots black political organization that had been so powerful in the early years of Reconstruction. Um, that was known as Big R Redemption, the movement to redeem the South and the and the men um, who were involved in that, the politicians refer consciously referred to themselves as redeemers. And it becomes known as the Redeemer movement in the mid to late 1870s. Yeah, and I, I noticed too that there's a that redeemer uh, notion is you know obviously trying to reestablish white supremacy and domination over the the newly f- freed slaves, but at the same time, um, you know there's this tension that develops between um, white violence and what you kind of talked about a minute ago with like black violence and um, how those two um, kind of played off each other. And obviously, white violence was more sanctioned than black violence, but there's the this notion of connecting it to being a citizen and, uh, and a good man in some ways in the, in the white. And then, the, yeah. Right, right. They're both in though both of those groups are animated to a certain extent by the idea of armed self-defense and by the necessity of armed self-defense and the virtues of armed self-defense. Um, of course, for um, black men to exercise that right, whether they are part of the United States military during and after the Civil War, or they're taking up offices like sheriff, which is one of the most hotly contested um, uh, local sort of county level um offices in the South during this period, um, or whether they're taking part in state and local militias um, during this time period. Of course, the very act of them sort of claiming that right to arm self-defense becomes a um, an ignition right for the white paramilitary movements that are that are going to pop up at the same time to keep black men from claiming the right and exercising the right to armed self defense um so it's it's all sort of mixed up and circulating together um and and is in some way sort of one of the cruxes of the entire period well one of the things that was surprising to me because i i think in popular history, we kind of know the rise of the Klan, Ku Klux Klan, and some of these white councils. Um, that's I think that's what they call. But the um, but what I was surprised by was this violence around elections. Mm-hmm. Maybe if you could talk a little bit about how that happened, and specifically the the what was eighteen. 18- 68 or when was that? The presidential election in 1868. So yeah, in 1867, you know, black men are allowed to vote for the first time. Um, And it was one of the conditions on which the Southern states uh, were to be readmitted into the union was allowing black men to vote. And then ultimately, of course, in 1870, the 15th amendment is ratified um, to the constitution. But beginning in 1867, when black men began casting votes, organizing themselves politically into political organizations, supporting candidates, you know, they overwhelmingly and not surprisingly, right, support the Republican Party, the party of Lincoln, the party of union, the party of emancipation. Um, For white Democrats on the other side of the line, um, some at first they try to sort of woo um, African-American voters uh, to, I think, a limited extent. But there are some who try to form kind of coalitions or say, you know, you can't trust those northern Republicans. We're your friends. You've lived with us 
us, you know, you know us, we'll take care of you. Um, and for the most part, black people in the South are like, yeah, right. <laughs> right. They know which side of their bread is buttered, so to speak. And by and large, they throw their lot in with the Republican Party. And this gives the Republican Party national ascendancy, you know, throughout the late 1860s and the early 1870s. And so once white Democrats realize that they're not going to be able to sort of co opt um, the black vote, um, then it becomes you know, a matter of figuring out how to defraud the black vote, how to limit the black vote, how to keep black people from voting, either through outright intimidation uh, or, or armed violence. Um, and the 1868 presidential election um, was, uh, you know, a powerful moment when um, those efforts most notably by organizations like the Ku Klux Klan, um, which is sort of a paramilitary arm of the Southern Democratic Party at that point, um, becomes, you know, that that kind of, you know, effort to use violence and intimidation to restrict black voting really becomes, you know, has its foundational moment. Yeah, and it was not only um, black people who were targeted by this, but also people who were white people potentially voting Republican. Sure. And, it, and, and that was the thing that struck me, which is, <laughs> especially, you know, we hear today how divided we are. And when I read this, I was like, well, they're, at, they're literally shooting each other <laughs> trying to get to the ballot box. And that it was just... Uh, <laughs> Dark reminder. Of how <clears throat> you know, it's I always have to remind my students, you know, we're used to voting today. We go in a voting booth. You know, there are sides. We have a secret ballot. No one's looking over your shoulder. When you voted in the 19th century, you would walk up to the polling place and there would be, you know, two boxes. Um, a box for the Republican candidate, a box for the Democratic candidate. And you would have and the, the poll person would ask you, which ballot do you want? And you would have to say in public in front of everyone, oh, I want that one. And then you would have to go and physically put it in that person's box. So everyone knew who you were voting for, right? You couldn't sort of, you know, count on having privacy um, at the polling place. And there were no laws prohibiting groups of people, political organizations to gather at the polling place, um, to yell at you, to bring their guns, <laughs> uh, to throw things at you, to follow you to and from. So it was a really different experience, I think, than what we are used to, you know, today um, when we go to vote. Yeah, that's an important point. Um, I want to talk another uh, talk about another aspect of kind of the violence that was happening and the white violence, especially was the um, this notion of we. I I think we understand how it keeps the African American intimidated and and down. But what did the white male um, get from this organized violence? And specifically, I'm thinking about how. You mentioned in the book that the war really, the Civil War and emancipation crippled white men, literally and figuratively. And I think maybe if you could talk about how the the violence kind of served to um, identify and and kind of uh, contour masculinity in the South. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, for both Northerners and Southern veterans who have fought in the war, those men, um, you know, it was a defining moment in their life and it became a, a large part of their identity of who they were and who they had been, right? Was was their, were their wartime experiences and their battlefield experiences. Um, and particularly, I think for Southern men, it has a different sort of twist because of course they lost, Right. Um, and they're in some ways, you might could say emasculated because of that experience. You know, they come home. They're not the victors. They are not. Um, they can't sort of, you know, they find other ways to claim sort of a moral victory. Right. And we know about the lost cause mythology, you know, surrounding sort of Southern memory of the war. Um, but particularly, I think, like in the in the early you know, post 
uh, war period. It's very difficult for Southern men to try to reclaim some of that honor, right, that they had lost in the war. Um, and so I think, you know, becoming, you know, acting it out as the protectors of their homes, of their communities, of democracy as they understood it and believed it should be lived, um, that became a way to sort of rehabilitate themselves as sort of, you know, as men and as citizens um, during this period. So I think it takes on, you know, you're right, it has a practical effect, right, suppressing the black vote very practical um, um, and they're very good at it and it works, it's very efficacious. Um, but it also has sort of a deeper um, psychological and cultural um, importance that goes beyond that, that immediate um, utility. Yeah, and I, I think that the uh, the way you kind of st uh, stated in the book at one point is that Southern manhood or men manhood becomes tied into racism and self interest, and you know that's why you see these paramilitary groups kind of forming and and the KKK obviously reigning terror, and then um, I I kind of want to talk about why violence maybe um, was was the, the preferred tool of suppression. You know, because we obviously had uh, black codes developing around this time and the Jim Crow kind of developing legally, but then there's this extra legal mm -hmm. terror aspect. And it's kind of what you were talking about with 9-11, like the impact of it is more important than the mm -hmm. than the than the actual action, right? And there is a sort of uh, there's a spectacular element to a lot of it, uh, especially the bigger acts of violence and rioting um, that I discuss in the book. Um, and it's, um, it's in many ways becomes non-utilitarian, right? So, the, um, you know, bodies or people are maimed, they're dismembered, they're disfigured. Um, it becomes... I think for individuals who are participating in this, oftentimes an act of rage, whether it's actual rage at that person who has done something to you, or it's just sort of an enactment of this larger sort of uh, rage at how the world, your world as a white Southern man has been turned upside down. Um, but I, you know, there are those sort of spectacular elements to it that go sort of transcend and go beyond just merely trying to frighten someone and to keep them from from going to the polls on election day. Um, and and you know, and that is, you know, when a little bit um, trickier to deal with as a historian um, to try to to pull some of this together. Um, but I was informed, you know, by reading. Um, about violence and people who have experienced and witnessed violence of this kind in other parts of the world and other parts and other time periods, particularly writings about the Holocaust um, and the treatment of Jewish people, um, uh, the way which they were sort of objectified and dehumanized before they were killed in a way that, you know, doesn't really just sort of speak to the just utility of trying to, you know, eradicate people, it was necessary to also dehumanize um, and objectify them first. Um, and I saw some of that at certain times with the descriptions of these riots and murders happening to Black people in the South as well. Well, and there's a continuation, um, isn't there, of this kind of tension between African Americans and the, the ex-slaves being kind of uh, dupes and very uneducated and childlike and needing this protection, but then on the other hand, being this existential threat that at any moment could overwhelm us all and, you know, take over the South and kill all the white women and, you know, that whole, like, narrative. Right. So there was this, like, make up your mind, which one is it? Right. 
Well, it's, that's part of the dehumanization, right? It's- exactly. So the one saying they will say, you know, they will sort of try to justify, you know, we shouldn't give, allow black people the right to vote because they don't have the mind for it, right? They're they're easily led, they're easily influenced, they're not independent, they're they're not smart enough. Uh, but at the same time, you know, obviously they are <laughs> because they're really great at political organization and and getting the vote out. Um, so you have both of those things those going on at once. Yeah. Well, and I, I think I kind of want to end with the, um, cause you talk about a couple of really, um, profound and, uh, white riots, I guess they were. Um, so maybe if you could kind of just, you know, don't get too ways the weeds, but kind of the, the, the major kind of like what happened at uh, Battle of Liberty Place, which, you know, I, I saw the monument was just taken down about 10 years ago, so. Mm-hmm. so um, but the, um, yeah, so maybe you could kind of talk to us about how White Riot manifested itself in the, in the fear of Black Riot. Right. So yeah, the Battle of Liberty Place took, uh, happened in New Orleans in 1874 and was actually um, a coup d'etat uh, of the state government, which was controlled by a Republican governor at the time. Um, and the White League, the Crescent City White League, which is, they're basically a paramilitary group. Um, they're like the Klan, but they don't wear masks, right? They're not afraid to show their face. And it's actually, after the 1872 Enforcement Acts, it's a federal crime to ride around on a horse mask and intimidate people. So they just take the masks off. And so you have these white leagues forming throughout the Deep South. Um, And the Crescent City White League is, you know, very active politically. They have lots of parades. Um, lots of protests against the Republican governor, against black office holders. Um, and beginning in 1874, the, the white leagues in Louisiana and Mississippi and eventually South Carolina as well, began a kind of coordinated effort. Uh, and their motto is peaceably if we can, but forcibly if we must. They are going to redeem and take back uh, their state governments from Republican control. Um, so the Crescent City White League in New Orleans in 1874, what precipitates that riot um, is the governor gets wind that they are, uh, the Crescent City White League is about to receive a shipment of arms from, I believe it's New York City. Um, and so they, he sends the uh, Metropolitan Police, the New Orleans Metropolitan Police, which is actually functions as, the, as part of the state militia at that time, and ironically is led by none other than James Longstreet, the famed Confederate general who becomes sort of a Republican supporter um, after the Civil War. It's an in- interesting sort of aside. Um but Longstreet and his Metropolitan Police go and they intercept this arm shipment. Um, they take the guns. And when the Crescent City White League sort of organizes, they're going to go and get their guns, right, and take them back. And so this is how the, the riot break, breaks out between the White League and the Metropolitan Police, which are in New Orleans, uh, I don't know if it's a majority black police force, but there's a lot of there are a lot of black men on that police force. Um, it takes a couple of days. Um, quite a few people, several dozen people, are killed, and for a moment, for a, a day or two, basically the Louisiana state government, which at that time is seated in New Orleans, not Baton Rouge, it moves to Baton Rouge later. Um, the governor leaves, he flees, and the Crescent City White League sort of assumes control of the state government for a couple of days in 1874 until President Grant sends federal troops um, to restore the Republican governor and elected officials in New Orleans, state officials in New Orleans. So even though the Crescent City White League, this coup d'etat, is ultimately unsuccessful at that moment, it becomes sort of a siren call, if you will, for 
white leaguers throughout Louisiana, but also in other deep South states like Mississippi and South Carolina. And eventually it sort of ushers in this very violent uh, opposition to the 1876 presidential election. Um, in both Mississippi and South Carolina um, and ultimately helps. Um, although, you know, 1876 is a contested election. Rutherford B. Hayes ultimately is elected. Um, but the deal, of course, um, that the southern states like South Carolina um, and Mississippi, uh, you know, sort of require for their support is that the Republican uh, Party could sort of pull the federal government pulls its troops and pulls its influence out of the South and sort of restores home rule um, to those very people who have just, you know, um, sort of upset those elections in those states. So <laughs> that's the abbreviated sort of history of, of the Crescent City White League and the Battle of Liberty Place, um, which is this, you know, you know, really kind of wild moment in American history where we have a coup d'etat of a state government, short lived, ultimately unsuccessful or immediately unsuccessful. But I think in many ways you can read it as being ultimately successful um, in what it set out to do, which is to sort of unite white people around um, this idea that um, the South needs to be redeemed um, by force. Yeah, that's a, it's an interesting story, and um, I I don't like to draw parallels to today, but it it had some uh, some striking resemblances to things some some things that happened a couple of years ago. So it's yeah, interesting. Uh, yeah, for historians like me who study Reconstruction and, and study political violence, uh, yeah, it's been painful to, to sort of watch some of these events um, and the and the dialogue and discussion over them um, over the past few years. Well, yeah, and I, I was also struck by, and your book spends some time talking about the, the role guns play both in white and black communities and, and how the the threat of armed black people was just so, um, th well, just the idea of armed black people was so threatening and that, it you know, it brought in a whole other mm -hmm series of questions but that's yeah. for another conversation I think. yeah it, it's a it's a really important moment if you're interested in sort of this broader history of american gun culture it's a really important moment in the formation of um people's attachment to guns individually not just collectively but individually um and also you know sort of an infusion of white supremacy um and racialized fear of of black people um becoming more and more a part of that yeah well yeah the political agency is one thing and then self-defense is another piece of that whole puzzle so. right well, thank you for your work, and uh, this was, um, I learned a lot from your book, and, and as I say, it was uh, striking to me, some of the things that you brought in. So is there anything you would like to leave us with as far as, like, if we could take away one thing from your, <laughs> the elevator pitch, what would it be? <laughs> um, you know, I think, you know, for me, if you, if you want to understand you know, our political divisions, our political uh, issues today, um, questions about political violence, about the role of guns in American culture. I think it's very important for people to go back and look at the Reconstruction period because it's a really formative moment for that um, and for these issues and for our culture um, as a society and what we're still sort of trying to work through. So I would encourage people, if this is something, you know, that they're interested in, to go back and 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 look more at Reconstruction and the wonderful work that's been done um, in the past. I guess 25 or 30 years. Well, yes, thank you for your time and thank you for thank your you book. for having me. It was incredibly readable and I, you know, we have it here at the library so people can check it out and read it themselves. Fantastic. And thank you for doing your series and, and helping people engage with history and these important um, issues today. <laughs>